What if the math we use to understand the world is ultimately why we think there is or isn't free will? It's interesting that those who are most familiar with the best functions we've found to model the laws of the universe are often those most likely to deny free will. Physicists, engineers, biologists, including neuroscientists, will often see any kind of brain, meaty or machiny, as simply a complicated function. In such a determined mathematical form, there is simply no room for doing otherwise even using those dicey stochastic processes in quantum mechanics. Still, the distributions are determined, even if so-called random samples of them are unpredictable. Understandably, you'd hear, well, where's the choice in that, really? But what if even strings and strings and strings of all kinds of functions, all connected and layered together as complexly as possible, cannot capture everything about the universe? And what if our science is so deeply steeped in standard set theoretic mathematics that we struggle to understand what doing otherwise could even mean? See, even some of the wildest geometries, topologies, and algebras that we currently imagine are standardly based upon sets of numeric values morphed by deterministic functional forms in any number of dimensions and ways. So what's wrong with thinking the universe and everything in it, including our choices, are all made with these functions? Well, remember, the outcome of any function is predetermined by which function is used, along with what it's fed as input. These structures work together to determine the output via some parameterized algorithm, reliably mapping information from the input, but not because these parts are making decisions in ways where they could have done otherwise for the same input. They are truly optionless as they plug and chug. Even if the function is set to morph over time in some way, it simply changes from one locked-in structure to another based on a pre-chosen algorithm. This is true even if you'd be hard-pressed to predict what a function will do in a given case after all the cranks are cranked, which is of course part of their usefulness if you trust what it's doing. Still, every time you run a particular snapshot of a function over again using the same inputs, you should get the same clearly determined answer. If you don't, there's a hardware or software bug that inadvertently changed the algorithm. Functions can be gorgeous tools of reliability, so we use them everywhere, especially in science, to model just about everything, even systems that don't exhibit such sturdy, steadfast behavior. But we have hacks for that too, mostly with processes that boil down to injecting some noise that eludes our understanding, wiggling an effective new dial in the determinism. See, even if we don't allow ourselves to look at the noise we've added to a functional process, whether it's generated by unpredictable pseudo-random functions or a measure of natural decay, technically this noise is just another flavor of input, pre-identified for the function, seeding some determined scrambling. Yes, even noise input settles into an effective past entering the function at any point in the process, all proceeding in a mechanical, decided way. Nowhere within such a computation lurks an opening for what we might call a true choice or an undetermined decision, makeable by whatever substantiates the computer it's running on. No option magically opens up to change the course of the program unless a pause is baked in to receive further input from, say, a human. But that's just more past input when the algorithm carries on. Even if we add tons of complicated lines and layers to the algorithm, no choice truly emerges within. But what is cocooning this multitude of choices for how functions are put together in the first place? Who is ultimately designing how eventualities will be handled or what kind of noise and data they're given? Or all those micro and macro architectural decisions of say, a deep neural net algorithm itself? Well, don't worry, we function wielders say. We're figuring the details out still, but why not go ahead and figure every such choice has already been made, in a sense, by nests of other functions sourced all the way back to the beginning of everything. Increasingly comfortable with stochastically fluctuating infinitesimals and seas of calculus, you hear more and more entertain that we merely live in an infinite hypersphere of functional turtles, making time a reversible illusion in theory, and leaving the mysterious origin of all this functioning to one of many multiverse concepts or other deus ex machinas of one's choosing, anthropic or otherwise. 
Oh, but then there are no true choices for the poor creatures of Earth, or anywhere else in this universe for that matter. But you know, a lot of people who haven't been indoctrinated in this kind of story say it's a little crazy not to believe in free will, this belief that we can do otherwise. Little of our day-to-day -day thoughts, actions, and languages make any sense without it. Little about our society makes any sense without it. Not that our society is always making sense, but is free will really just a shorthand for, well, it's really all my particles fuzzily bouncing around, brought here by the Big Bang and a bunch of galaxy stellar geological and biological evolution which all committed an egregious crime, not my decision per se. Reams circling the earth have been sacrificed to understanding these philosophical dilemmas. But then when it comes right down to it, what really should be the logic here? What's the math? Exactly what are we doing going around scratching our heads all day trying to make these decisions? Would evolution really favor these blobs of jelly that flop around so indecisively, mulling about what they want and deciding to change their minds about what they want, if that wasn't so advantageous ultimately? Why not just burn through generations of imperfect but randomly fluctuating functions at the speed of light to get those optimal zombie life forms? Balanced and probably quite boring. Within a computer simulation, like the game of life, freedom seems not to exist, let alone these things we call wills. We can stare all day amazed at these blinking pixels watching the apparent evolution, but doesn't it look somewhat different to the world around us? Say if you go into the forest or desert and watch or listen quietly enough. And by the way, John Conway stopped playing the game of life when it was revealed to be a universal Turing machine. Indeed, the fun in that game is all in its setup of grid, config, and rules. Once it's running, it's just a function from there like any other chugging away numerically, even if we jiggle it with noisy augmented inputs. But should we appeal to authority about this? Or even to our feelings? Especially that funny one called fun. That's all a little wishy-washy. Can we do better? Suddenly you wake up. You're strapped to train tracks. No worse. It's a trolley. And it's coming right for you. Now you realize your mind is connected to a computer prompt that commands. I will unlock your shackles as soon as you give me a program which correctly predicts if any program will end. You fumble with mind python, vaguely recalling your lessons. Deaf. Oh no. If an imposing procedure simply does the opposite of whatever the halt checking code does, it will stop when the input program runs forever and it will run on when the program it's fed stops. Then if this opposing program is fed back into itself, the halt checker becomes helplessly incorrect as whatever it determines about the opposing program will be the opposite of what it actually does. This is a stupid game, you scream. Then the shackles of the trolley halting problem vanish and you wake up again. Great, it was just a dream, or was it? You go for a walk in the woods to clear your head and the path before you forks. You think, well, I do know what I want in life, in general, I think, but it's not really clear which of these paths ahead will better get me there. No amount of functioning I can pull together in my frame can tell me either. I'd hang here forever, calculating away. The universe is too chaotic to accurately predict when things get this uncertain and the options you're presented are so disconnected from how you understand your state of desires. You simply have to choose. So do you throw some dice? Do you go with the side you think is prettier? Or rather, that one over there that most people wouldn't go anywhere near because you like to see what happens. What if something about you, inside or among your fuzzy cogs, is beyond a mere function? What if there is something that is part of you which is not itself a rule, but rather can sort through which rules to adopt, collecting your wants and desires, even if it's a messy business? What if you are actually making real decisions that begin and end with you, rummaging around the memories of the day, 
updating and sometimes abandoning rules you'd previously adopted that didn't work out so well. You consider past mistakes and even dreams of alternative scenarios. The ones that bring you pain or peril you wish to never return to, you try to remember in as universal a way you possibly can. You seek to live another day and discover more about what the heck is going on around here. So what is the fuller math of the universe if not a bunch of law-like functions? Well, as fun as laws are, let's return to those decidey games for a try. You know, the ones we seem drawn to from birth. Even when we're still trying to get a handle on these rule things without breaking them, we might ponder why evolution, including the endorphins it gave us, says, hey, take another look at this fun stuff. What's really grabbing your attention through all those swirls of noise, even bringing your energies away from critical importances like food and sleep? We stop playing a game sequence when it loses its fun, when it becomes clear how things will end. And this tends to be when the game sequence chills into a number. It turns out games harbor some very serious fun indeed, an openness that emerges combinatorially by growing undecided options, not possible to find in any of these determined functional forms that we cling so tightly to in standard science. But look, games are not doomed to be forever undecidable either. They are undecided until a player or two or more decides them. But then one game position rather turns into another and we might as well recognize each position and sequence as a different game altogether, stepping forward in time with a kind of coherence connecting it to the past. This stepping kind of substructure emerging from gameplay we might as well call time. And a much more important discovery from John Conway besides functions of not quite real life is that it turns out numbers are games. Ones that play out in the most determined functional sequences. We can predict how any sequence following a number game will end. More precisely, we know which playing side will move last in a numeric exchange, sooner or later, no matter who is moving next or how. Numbers are not always totally invariant, as technically little subtle choices actually still hide away in number games, such as how a player can choose fewer or fuller step counts to play the value of a number out to an end game. For example, you can count to three in three steps by counting to one three times over, or you can count to three in one step by counting three at a time. But these are not the most open kinds of choices. Thankfully, not every game is a number, else the universe as we know it would be far simpler, perhaps too simple, even too simple for us to become aware of how complicated it can be. And it would be no fun. Relatedly, there are probably many non-coincidences about why the funnest games are decidedly not numbers. We need to look at an example, but first a quick disclaimer. If you've learned any classical or combinatorial game theory before, get ready to relax some of the typical assumptions. I've never heard the following argument on free will taught or explained by any lecturer, paper, or book like I will shortly do for you, so please let me know what you think in the comments. If I've indeed clumsily stumbled into an observation overlooked or undersold by some of our favorite players, then I understand these circumstances are reason enough to be skeptical, but hear me out. These points I've partially made in previous work were probably too buried in braids with the rest of play's complexity I handle all too carefully. It's just that honestly, free will is just one of many threads in the mathematical structures that Conway called games that all tangle together in such abundant riches, all exciting me to no end as a physicist, AI scientist, musician, artist, person, whatever I am. Let's get into it with a game that is decidedly not a number. It has a value I've taken to calling fork. Now, if there is a more legit name for fork, please let me know. I have developed a lengthier formal title for this game derived from its symmetries and lack thereof described more in links below. Fork can be found from day two on of combinatorial game construction, which in Conway lingo means it's born after two birthdays, or in my interpretation, after a minimum of two time steps necessary to build it. We find fork upon the same rung of the combinatorial game lattice that you'll find the values up and up star discussed further elsewhere. 
These are each very interesting games, and as far as true choices go, we could easily be looking at Upstar instead of Fork. See the little commas in their formal labels. They're important. But Fork gives us a few extra kicks to consider. Oh, and now you're shaking your head saying, wait, what the heck does all of this notation mean again? Don't panic. Let's step through how we construct a fork before we play it. And then you'll get to know fork and the game formalism a little better. First, forget set notation. Games use no standard notation of set theory, which if you already know well, you'll have to keep remembering. The slash here doesn't signal a rule the set conforms to as much as a value it represents from the juxtaposition of sides found around it. The sides are collections of options that each player may play to. Simply two players in this case we call left and right. So yes, we do technically have two sets here. In a sense, Conway generalized Cantor. And if you know Dedekind's work, this should remind you of his cuts too. But the sidefulness of these collections of values is critically important. A game's composed value actually lies between what appears as sets. A value that is not necessarily found in any of the individual sets that compose it unless the game is potentially loopy, but generally they needn't be. And so what ensues from this kind of construction won't be recovered by set theory alone. And you'll have no need to trust me on that. You'll see for yourself. Now in either series or parallel for any game, we will need to set up each player's options. We tend to favor the left player and our perennially unfair conventions. So we'll look at that side first, but not because it needs to be built first. In Fork, the only move available to left is the game we'll call one. To construct such an option, we'll begin as we always must for any option with a zero game where no game options meet no game options. A whole lot of nothing for a value composed. But now that a zero has been born, we can build a new game with it by giving it to a player for something to move to. When we give this option to move to zero to left in particular with an optionless right, that turns out to be the game one. This, as you might expect, is a number game because as Conway instructs in his worthy definition, none of left's options are greater than or equal to rights. Yes, that's a rule. As it turns out, definitions pretty much are but definitions are rules that are so good we don't actually need to assume them to discover them in a structure. Game construction will generally birth numbers conforming to this definition, whether we start with it or not. So it's passive in a sense, because it doesn't do anything but help us interpret the structure after the fact. In the number one, since right has no options anyway, the rule holds true. Let's now set this game aside for left and move over to right's options. Okay, reminding ourselves again what this whole fork was supposed to be about. Rights option should be a zero game as well as a star. All right, we'll need another zero, easy enough. Remember, there's nothing to it. Well, perhaps bringing a couple of structureless sides together for a zero is not as trivial a play as it first appears. It's not exactly the same concept as the lonely set we call zero, but the game zero won't be the only option for right. Remember, we also need to build a star, which will be a decidedly less numeric value to add to the mix. Star's recipe gives both sides an option to move to zero. Composed, these options mean star is a game value where left or right may end the game by moving to zero, depending on who will move first. Now note how every option we've constructed is essentially nested up compositions of the empty set, each step of which virtuously creates a sequence. And you know, a sequence this coherent and well-founded provides more than a flavor of continuity. These sequences smell rather Lipschitzian, if you know anything about that, meaning they reflect all along that they've been built from what has come before, something we'd be tempted to parametrically understand functionally. However, more is usually read into what's called Lipschitz continuity, and building out games is by no means a smoothly differentiable kind of functional relationship in the classical sense. But building a game is a coherent way of changing a form in a kind of order, generally partial order, yet all values composing it are quite discrete. 
But see, in a game, discrete does not mean unconnected. These values of interactions are nothing if not relationships, being born of and representing connection. It may take some stewing to realize just how radically different this game paradigm is to our normal presumptions in science about changing structures, where we base the concepts of time and space upon confused and lonely sets like the impossible to construct real numbers. By the way, I mean these descriptions dispassionately and technically, no disrespect intended. The reals have some problems, however, despite their usefulness. Let's now turn to what it means to play a game with the value fork, which is very much not a real number, technically, but may still be a game value we find in reality. Putting aside for the moment the whole issue of how exactly we will instantiate this game beyond the formalism you see here, you might still be asking, don't games have winners and rewards? Well, that's a major part of classical game theory, but we are going to relax all those complicated assumptions for some simpler and more general starts to physical interactions. I could at this point take a bunch of time to explain what are called the normal outcome classes for analyzing any game, playing into what is called the fundamental theory of combinatorial game theory. But in the end, I would just melt it all away for physics, so check out the linked blog for more info on that. The truth is, rules are messy and complicated, even as they strain to clarify a situation. They help us forget things, sometimes too much. They emerge as valuable ways to shape and interpret how games are best played, presuming there is a particular way you want them to end. This can simplify game analysis for players, but never without assumptions that need to somehow hold, meaning enough structure already exists to bake an effective rule-like agreement into its substrate, or creates an effective memory somehow continually applying this additional layer of rule following. One of my articles below even discusses fork, in this theorem's context, but it's more than what we need for where we're driving to today. What we need to do now is finally turn to this business of discovering undecided structures. Let's go ahead and compose a fork from all the options we built to see what happens when we finally play this little game. Note how at this point in our sequencing, it's almost like time changes direction, going from building a structure for potential playtime to what will now be a kinetic game time playing the structure we previously set up back down. Curiously, we're not reversing time in the causal sense, however, as cause and effect remain ever onward. Mm-hmm. So, if left plays their only optionless option first, it's clear what will happen. Left will play to one, which then leaves right optionless, and then left may move to zero sooner or later to end the game. Yes, moving first, left was able to effectively evaporate all the options that right once had, like a wrinkled up tablecloth pulled suddenly flat. Thus, once we know left is moving first, fork's outcome looks rather determined, much like a function, much like a number. However, what happens when right moves first? Well, it depends. What will right choose to play to? If right plays to zero, right ends the game in one fell swoop evaporating any chance left may have had to move. Already, we see how fork is a bit of a superposition if we don't know who will move first. As a value, fork appears to lead to possibly one or two steps of movement, at least. But we're not done. If right chooses their other option and instead hands left a star, how golden of right, now left has the gift of choice themselves, potentially. See, it depends further yet. If left and right are alternating taking turns, and they are isolated in this game alone, then left is rather choiceless at this point. They have to end the game sequence sooner or later, playing to zero from the star that right has handed them. However, many stories may play out of a fork, especially a fork in the woven wood. Fork reveals a mathematical seed to what we could call context-dependent evaluation of a variable form. If fork isn't the only game left and right are engaged in, and they are rather playing in a whole sum of games around themselves, then left may be more focused on or even distracted by another component of their sum of play. Left may choose to miss 
or simply happen to miss, a chance to move on the star that Wright turned Fork into. This could allow Wright to choose to play again in this particular sequence after all taking what played out of this fork home to the end game at zero themselves in the end. Depending on what else is in their bundle of fun, perhaps Left doesn't actually want to be the last to move in this particular sequence for whatever reason. See, the so-called quote-unquote normal interpretation of a game presumes a rule where being the last to move is desired as a win. But we needn't assume this rule or even a context for winning to see a game still play out. And in fact, a rule might only gain its reality in the mind of one or more players beholding and applying it. Whether or not the universe commands universal rules in some way, we'll still be able to recognize patterns emerging from natural game sequences as they form and play out, where no hard and fast rules were required to build or play them. They just appear regular enough in the limited options that they could have been created from a rule. Even if they're actually from a lawless play, we'll keep delving into what all that means, but the point for now is that the games reveal true choices in the game structures themselves, no matter how they are interpreted by any possibly existing rules, as long as the structure somehow forms. So perhaps if there truly needs to be any rule, it could be that all interactions must form between sides of something. And that almost seems like a self-evident observation or even a mind-melting tautology of our language that still reflects a basic reality. So say we call this the axiom of complexity. Did we actually need it? Or does it just happen to be that if you have some lawless stuff, by default, it freely blobs about in unruliness? And sometimes the sides of the stuff may come together to play. Actually, it turns out there are so many gorgeous aspects of games inducted from structurelessness to observe. Their general values indicate that multiple paths to realize the future are open. But then when we play a value, only one option is taken out of the exchange structure. Thus, here we discover that little bit of open space for a choosy will. Ah, the will wasn't really needed as a hypothesis, just as long as a game like Fork gets constructed one way or the other, even by a function chugging away, building all possible games out of structureless sides, where the freedom is realized is in the play of the games that have been set up once they're getting played down. Remember the temporal substructure of play is built in the isomorphic steps we needed to set up a game, but rather opposingly. And interestingly, as you saw with Wright's option to zero and fork, sometimes an asymmetric number of steps are taken to play out the game generally. Might we even call the time it takes to set up a game its anti-time? That's awfully suggestive, but we too often forget how cyclical time is in its dynamism, ever emerging in construction and playful deconstruction, in orbits and clocks alike. Remember, time reflects how intrinsically tied we are to that workhorse we call energy, which comes in potential and kinetic flavors. But again, building anti-time doesn't change the causal flow needed to first set up a game before we play it, no matter how modfully we count the game time. Now, if your mind works at all like mine, you hear someone describing all these options for playing out a game, even as simple as fork, and your mind just kind of goes... You say, left plays to zero, and then right plays to gobbledygeslam. Nope, I don't get it. This is particularly frustrating because so many combinatorial game proofs include explanations like what I stepped through for Fork earlier, listing all the options to exhaustively show that a game value has a particular attribute or character, functional or otherwise. Yet if I haven't gone through the motions myself, I usually don't get it by passively hearing these kinds of explanations. This is why I don't do a massive amount of step-by-step -step walking through of games in my videos beyond just showing you the ropes. 
It gets tedious quickly and the effects are dubious. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that needs to get their own hands on a game to really get it. Playing sequences out myself to understand what comes from a value, as well as trying out what it means to adopt different rules that bias any play choices that come up. Doing this all in your mind can easily become a tangled mess if you don't have some partially embodied experience to draw upon. To strengthen these game mind muscles, sometimes I use pieces of dough or cloth or yarn or pieces of food or pieces of paper that I fold, rip, smash, twist, or simply scribble on in various ways to build and play out structures, as well as tally up amplitudes, uh, I mean Uh, possible value contributions to figure the overall possibilities from a value and sensibly evaluate what it means. The primer and some of my other material, as well as many other great resources, go through more details about how this canonically works using the concepts of equivalence and operations. Therein emerges the algebraic manipulation of games. The point is that I strongly encourage you to play with a fork and whatever substrate you want, perhaps by simply drawing it out on some paper at first. Just don left and right hats in whatever sequence and order you can dream up and track what happens across the different options of play. And check this out. Imagine we can isolate an instance of fork, meaning it's not part of any other sum that left and right are playing. In particular, let's imagine their game is tucked away in an opaque box that they themselves create, where left and right physically surround the options between them. This means that from the outside, we'll actually not know for sure if there is a fork in their box or any other game. We'll have no handy dandy labels about how the game between them was constructed, nor can we see precisely what values are unfolding in the sequence they are experiencing. Except we will be able to see when left or right move and tally up who moves in which order. Now watch them play out a fork only once. Looking at their moves alone, we're quite confused about the game in the box, huh? If left goes first, then this game could easily have looked like the number two. Remember, we won't know what right ever had for options. If right instead goes first, this could appear to have been the value negative one, or perhaps a value I call anti one half. Sorry, the latter terminology I'm introducing and the prefix anti comes from how this game inverts or swaps the value known as one half without being its completely opposing negative. Anti one half is kind of like a sign forgetful negative one half. Yes, that's incredibly interesting for a gazillion reasons, but let's keep playing the hidden fork box. If right instead plays their star rather than moving to zero, then we might guess there is an up in the box or any other game where star is an option for right. It's very much worth mentioning too that this all presumes left moves positively and right moves negatively. Otherwise, when we say a game looks like two, it could instead look like negative two and the negative one might otherwise look like a one, etc. But if we just understand this convention symmetry for what it is, as a way to label the direction of left and right's moves, it's a sneaky kind of rule we adopt, a definition. Then even if you play fork twice over, giving left and right each a chance to go first, you still can't say for certain what game they started with. It looks like it could be this funny anti one half value again, or this sweet little game I call spoon. Bah. Here's where I suddenly realized that anti one half might as well be called a knife. After all, it's a particular kind of reflection of a cut, the number one half in particular here, usable to section out many a fine piece. Well, there is actually a massive story to tell here related to Fork's potential confusion with spoon, knife, as well as the number two. In just this way, it turns out that when you subtract either fork or spoon from knife, getting a kind of distance between them, you'll get a different component of the canonical basis of irreducible representations of values that form the group structure born on day two of general combinatorial game construction. But whoa, that's a lot of lingo for those still getting familiar with algebra and group theory in particular. Let me try to summarize more simply. A basis of any space is fundamental to understanding it. 
And part of the basis for two-step relational structures is the plain old value we call one half. Yes, we love our Raymond zeta function flags, and it's just part of a whole plateful of non-numeric symmetries that stretch between all the cutlery emerging from games, all physically and mathematically fascinating. Alas, it's really a whole Nota story to finish telling on a Nota day. Back to our wiggly blobby little opaque box of mystery. You know the trick now. It's not that the story needs to be a rather impossible sounding magic show where a box simultaneously contains a live two, or is it a dead one, or is it an up or a down or a knife or an anti-knife, all fuzzing around in an unphysical wave function of probability that magically collapses to just one of the possibilities when measured, or I mean played. It's much more simple than that. This is just a little game. The players making this box made the game fork between them, which they can then play, which we can read through sideful counts, and which, if we want to see it played again, they will need to then reform in another setup of fork. The outcome of each round is not determined before they play it, and they are possibly both responsible for what happens. Yes, this is indeed a glorious key to understanding superpositions and how we may come to see what lies behind those gnarled natural doors called entanglement. For even with a humble fork, it seems that to confidently recognize we have one, we really must either build it ourselves in a transparent box kind of way, oh, uh, and somehow remember that we have built it as we begin to play it, keeping it from being altered in the meantime, or we need to play this mystery game over and over and over again before the characteristic distribution of fork begins to take shape in the results understanding somehow from context what kind of biases the players are moving with because the distribution shifts with bias or we need to ourselves be either left or right and feel out what we and the other side has as an option if we can maybe we won't know until it's over even if we had a way to correctly predict a fork it's hard to imagine how else we might infer with confidence that we do indeed have a fork in the box. This is what it means for a value to be exactly specified as a superposition, yet still variable in how its value may unfold through measurement. This quickly becomes impossible to capture in a function of rather lonely set theory, as the complexity of interacting sets grows in games. In fact, many more game values are like fork, holding true open undecided variation than are number-like in their values. Although remember the mention earlier, even numbers can vary a little in how they are played out. If we continue to liken observing play to measuring a form we don't play ourselves, measurement becomes this pragmatic way to extract countable information from played games. Connecting games in broader sums of players and the values between them, trade-offs start to emerge, like energy over time or momentum over positions, and quite a lot of wavy jazz you probably already know a great deal about from other contexts. This becomes especially wavy as the game counts scale up in increasingly large sums with players' movements correlated amongst. Overarchingly, the game fork exemplifies how quick it is to build a mathematical relationship that is not determined ahead of time by all the parameters and inputs and algebraic relationships or even conditional logics and any other kind of standard operational sequences that we can classically encode that may construct it. Fork shows how outcomes may vary, but this variation is not solely determined by the past that composes it, or even who gets to move first in it. At least one decision is required to play fork out whenever right is allowed to move first. This makes fork a very hard, stubborn demonstration of emergent complexity. And isn't this why we love the deeply wild complexity of games after all? 
and for some, more so even than all those gorgeous, unpredictable, beguiling, yet still determined shows of chaos we study from numbers and their functions alone. When a non-numeric game is built, the player's choices aren't so baked in from the beginning as they are in functions of numbers. Decisions can be tied to functional forms, but they don't need to be. Ultimately, only at game time can those choices truly be made, as presets and connective correlations can always be disrupted ahead of the actual play. Earning this thing we call time, it's causal association, but it's not even the abstraction of time that causes the effects. It's the players who truly produce causes and play to effects, which they do through their substructure we sensibly label time. Even more, when we deconstruct a game value through steps of choiceful play, we are gifted a beautiful beaded string of moments we might as well call the present. Moments given to us as players to play a role in their choosing, but never alone and only for the limited options we are entwined with in our little part of the universe. A vast network of presence, creating playful togetherness and similar moments for all the other playing sides of whatever we all are, are spread out across the rest of the universe, propagating their effects no faster than the speed of play, the speed of exchange, which might as well be the speed of light for the quickest games we know of. Ultimately, a player can only play the hand they are dealt. These hands, more often than not, are unfair. In the coldest exchanges of the most extreme numeric circumstances, coercion happens. But where even the smallest values of warmth fold and twist away, options a player chooses are not completely determined by the doors of the past as they shut. Thus, with this partial determinacy, a little window from each present moment is underway and opening. They sparkle scattered in selections made by the players untangling them, but we wouldn't exactly call the players random functions either. Not necessarily. Even if a player ties their choice to an effective dice roll elsewhere, abdicating the little window of control they could have exercised in another way, it is still a decision they technically made, and actually a fairly sophisticated way to resolve an unavoidable choice. Thus, we typically need to zoom out to the fuller game field to better understand what might be influencing players' choices in any individual game components. And all of this holds whether or not the players play mindfully or consciously, we could say. Indeed, something about the broader field could be limiting the awareness or even access to choices players may have otherwise had, reducing the values and play out of games to more predictable sequences. Maybe the flow of the field translates to players' moves, including a bias in which players make their moves, say for which sides get to always kick off the set games. Remember how we've already seen that a fork played leaning to the left looks more limited and determined than it truly was as a full setup structure before play. If for whatever reasons players play with a uniform bias to their choices over time, their repetitive play of a game like fork will appear quite exploratory and rather stochastic, filling out a maximally neutral distribution of outcomes for lack of a better description. The statistical envelope that appears so determined across unpredictable outcomes is simply a flattened fingerprint of the game tree, always revealed in projection through the player's biases and choices, what generally shifts the probability distribution. Bias could be driven more intrinsically by the player's own choices connecting components of play and a perceived goal, what might look like the moves of a shielded life form, evolving to persist, or it could be driven more extrinsically by the moves chosen all around it, what could look more like evolution of sand on a beach. Players can flow with their environment, relinquishing choice to the broader tides, or spin around relative to their surroundings, making an out-of-control kind of anti-choice choice, perhaps the closest thing we have to randomness. But look, they're still technically choices whenever not fully coerced. 
An outcome distribution is like a story told over and over again. And Fork's story looks one way when played by gentle, blissful waters, and rather different if, say, humans are playing at racing to end games. The spectrums of wills and their effects are wide and varied indeed. If we don't play Fork once we build it and instead compose it into increasingly more complicated values beyond, we could then play these extended games with that similar uniform anti-preferential bias again, causing the outcome distributions to broaden and ring. All part of this rather entropic story for how general structure depends upon this countable temporal substructure in all forms. Yes, there's loads more to say about that too, but remember, we're focused today. Players are not automata, but they can build and use automation in play in ways that may or may not relate to the fuller sum of games they connect. But if you try to perfectly predict what will happen in a fork, a true fork, every time, you're out of luck. In fact, that thought rings with a rather more impossible tone than even playing the bells of entropy. Once your fork predictor gets that good, you're probably not predicting a fork anymore or you're an unphysical fork demon. A fork is a fork is a fork. This structure, whether part of a broader sum of influential games or not, there are different sequential orderings possible to build a fork, and once it's built, truly infinite ways to bias the play out of a fork. But there is only one value that earns a unique label we happen to call fork, just like with the values one or anti one half. They each perch curiously atop a curve of time, as all games except zero require to come into and out of existence. The curve of time may be relatively counted in a non-unique way with any kind of ordinal, including some piadic kinds of counts that game people might otherwise call numbers. They're not numbers. Fork, like many other games, is built of numbers as well as numbers. That value star we built earlier is actually the first and simplest number born of a deep nebula of symmetric and orderable values. Numbers like star, star 2, star 3, and so on all build a field of characteristic 2. Usually studied in a kind of two-attic form, they admit p-attic forms as well, where p is a prime as well as the count of players. Just like with the reals, when we see these values as games, it really does clarify aspects of their modular forms that it's quite hard to understand simply from their more singular representations. These forms are neither positive nor negative, and it turns out numbers are logically even more extendable than your favorite classical computer mod P. But for general countable reality, this means that even the substructure of time needn't be counted with numbers to be measured and understood. The games have taught me that time naturally emerges as a relative measure from this still necessary reality of the steps it takes to form any value distinct from zero. These values are formed between sides of something best recognized at the liminal pause of energy's temporal flow between what action constructs the possibilities of a game and what will then play out of them. Value emerges as an extremal turn of this causal flow, but still a flow that must click ever onward. But that's just the temporal substructure. Values also tie together any space formable of potential and kinetic play in any exchange. The spatial dimensions and directions can be quite complex indeed, but the numerical order discoverable within games are relatively defined in a simple, sideful, or mirrored count, even when pushed beyond their total order in forking values. The result is a playful mix we might otherwise call space-time, a frame of which would be imagining the fullest sums of games we possibly can and all of what might extend out from our own reach as a player. 
The choices all of these games reveal in time are a quantized kind of freedom, providing us countable options as we play. Still, as players, we're free to adopt quite imaginative constructions of rules that would be infinite to explicitly name and explore. Alas, as horizon gazers, we must adopt a kind of shorthand specification to play with such boundless ideas in gesturing layers of their implementation. And sometimes we run away with those infinities in our physics. It's just that their loopy and asymptotic rules are so incredibly useful. Remember that Conway's recognizing numbers as combinatorial games were so dubbed surreal numbers by Don Knuth. So this then makes a value like fork, in a sense, beyond surreal. Indeed, many more games are sur surreal than surreal, all extendable beyond the reals. Since these sur surreal games are where we discover our freedom as players, that makes free will quite sur surreal. But seriously, I don't see any reason why these kinds of free and open interactions and countless others like them aren't playing out across the universe, so vast and so wild. But hey, we can test this, more so than we have already. We can see for ourselves how real physics may reveal a surreal physics born of a sur surreality, but graciously then, the turtles need not go on forever from there. If the universe never plays a fork or the other truly open games, then it becomes drastically more difficult to understand freedom and choice. If everything is born from and awash with determined mathematical structures alone, then where would there be any room for free will? An overbelief in set theory math as categorically all there is has led many a great mind to this conclusion. But these little hints from our experience suggest what we may find in further experimentation. Hints like our ability to visit these little fork-like places, the fact that we can understand the game fork, adopting whatever rules we like to understand it in different ways, from different perspectives, is indeed a great sign we are part of something truly playful. Whatever you choose to believe about the universe ahead of sufficient testing, I'd urge you not to deny out of hand that we do indeed have this little known, but still sound and finitely specifiable, mathematics. Games are math that simply admit true but limited freedom, growing freer with their entropic structural sprawl over emergent time. At the very least, keep in mind that this math is here for you, available for your use, should you choose to accept it. And games have this glorious capacity to clarify all these confounding paradoxes that form from functions of numbers alone. Because when did your functions ever make the true decisions when you're the one deciding to put them in charge of something? The deepest kind of truth may not be anything like a static string of states, simply updating from a universal rule set. Here we find a key source of paradox, including the classic liars one. This sentence is false. When it's true, it's false, and when it's false, it's true. Kind of like the halting problem, hmm? Rules are rather unfounded games. They strain to assign truth, but have no intrinsic connection to the empty set of structurelessness themselves. We might even say they are inventions. Nevertheless, this lack of grounding is what distinguishes rules from well-founded values. Our opposing function is the trickiest kind of rule, at times quite useful, but ultimately leaving us lost in understanding value beyond our own little rulescape. Whether built of well-founded nests of structurelessness or unfounded rules, games truly hold many possibilities for future states and simultaneity, and this game logic might just be the relativistic math of the universe, decidedly not recoverable with classical logic alone. And finally, especially giving so much credit to Conway for recognizing the surrealness of games, I must make explicit that my argument here is different from what Conway and Koken do in their free will theorem, interestingly enough, which states that if experimenters are free in choosing how to measure particles, the particles they measure are similarly free. 
That said, we can interpret their result to similar upshots, that determinism can't cut it, and the dream of randomness is merely a shadowy masquerade of determinism itself doesn't help. But many have thought that Conway and Koken jump too far from what is proven in their theorem with the axioms adopted. See links below for details. Detractors say, well, I don't think the experimenters are free, so by virtue of the proof, no matter how correct, neither are the particles, making all the so-called choices merely a product of their chaotic but determined pasts. Detractors would go on to say, so what have Coquette and Conway really done? But see, I don't think this comes from the merits of their work alone. Rather, we've gotten deeply wedded in physics to a particular kind of math adopted over the centuries that squeezes all the kinds of freedoms out from what we model, because that's often been the point, to determine the prediction decidably, computably, even if the best we can do is an expected distribution of what will happen, all without needing a decision maker to intervene at some point with their slow and clumsy choices and questionable intuitions. But Conway and Koken are right, not just with their proof. Randomness is not the opposite of determinism. I mean, the point of dice is it's hard to cheat at controlling them, but we play different word games and physics about all of this. Once dice land, they become a kind of past that determines the future. Free decisions, on the other hand, you must somehow at least partially but truly control at the moment of deciding, time ever onward, lest the time travel unravel it all. Yes, our decisions feel influenced to no end, but then what is this feeling when we sense a loss of control or that flood of regret once we realize we could have done otherwise, influencing our future behavior, but never perfectly? Don't we sense a partial control about ourselves? Let's not straw man it as total, complete, impossible freedom. But remember we can't ultimately appeal to feelings alone as real as they are for this extremely important foundation to social functioning. If experimenters' choices are predetermined and conspiratorially completely out of their control, then Koken and Conway do indeed show this makes the rest of the universe appear as an increasingly impossible conspiracy, especially as the entangled particles being measured are separated by light seconds, minutes, and beyond. If you refuse to accept that experimenters make a true free choice about what button to push on the box of their experiment, we're either left with a vast predeterminism of everything or it all crumbles away into impossible absurdity. But even detractors who deny predeterminism still say, don't tell me that freedom is possible or that determinacy is incomplete. Show me the math so we can go to the universe and further test it. And that is exactly what I'm doing for you here. Games are the math you've been looking for. And blessedly, there are many of them. They come in a gamut of flavors and types of sequences at different scales, some infinitesimal in value compared to others, some breaking suddenly in their functional behavior, but not incoherently if you know the underlying structure. None of it worthy of the name, random. You've already experienced the tip of the freedom fork yourself, and I bet you can even find it and a whole bevy of fun in your nearest forest or desert alike. Curiously, Conway clearly had a rather nameless fork and a gazillion other games in his back pocket. Granted, his pockets were overflowing with games, but he knew these structures of games more than anyone. So why not appeal to them in the free will paper? Well, maybe he wanted to, but people said, oh, it's hard to take games seriously, you know? But he was so irreverent and even proud of not listening to that kind of advice. And to see what I'm saying, you do need to first relax all the rules. As someone perennially in search for the simplest rules, maybe Conway couldn't suspend that a rule must apply at any given time to make for a cleanest kind of game theory. Well, but which rule you apply is a choice, and he often admits that players must be sensible and not make mistakes. But he was really into winning. 
I don't know. Maybe some things are just so obvious for some geniuses, they simply forget they can think about them. He clearly knew in his bones that free will exists, as expressed in his theorem with Koken and the way they saw fit. Anyway, we owe Conway a large debt of gratitude for combinatorial game theory, as well as the many who developed it alongside him. And we will forgive all of their emphasis on winning, as it's nice math. Excitingly, if we take my demonstration of freedom that goes well beyond the tip of the fork and combine it with what Conway and Co. can show, a gorgeous amount of informative structure further flows forth in all the quantized and juicy glory of games. But even more excitingly, we may actually have no need for any of the three axioms Conway and Co. can assume for their deduction what they dub spin and twin, along with either fin, min, or lin. Instead, we can look to what the games naturally provide us as they induct away from structurelessness. The playful fin emerges as the de facto speed of information transfer between players' turns. The playful spin comes from how games' outcomes generally can't be decided ahead of play. And for the playful twin, I suggest players may stretch to vast relative distances amidst the rest of space-time, even if delicately and disruptively, but still standing ready at a value to make moves against multiple sides of their superpositional sum of games, instantly correlating the outcomes of the entangled particle measurements. Yes, what if particles are simply the boundaries formed by orbifolds and gaps between all the relative sides of the universal something at play, none of which can be absolutely framed, no little objects existing independently of the rest. But possibilities for both implementing and interpreting these game ideas abound, and exploring all of that is what the rest of this channel is all about. The simplest point of all is that freedom can be discovered, possibly having always existed in the forms of combinatorial interactions, otherwise known as games. No matter how we interpret what exactly the players are as frames of reference or what we think that something of the universe is, as long as the universe entangles into playful structures, freedom can be found and eventually the development of a will as patterns persist and survive. That's the assumption that the universe plays games, not dice. Well, to be fair, even a falling die can be a little undecided quantum game. When whatever plays out the electron structures composing both die and table interact just at the edge of their options, when all the boundaries smack together Little wills of the wisps deciding through a blissful swirl of phases to photons just how the die will land. For this particularly favored picture of mine, it doesn't really make sense to call the stuff playing all these games mind or matter. So space-time stands in well enough for now. Or whatever you like to call that raucousness we thought was the vacuum, field-laden or naughtily not. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we're not in space-time as much as we're all simply part of it. Play is where and when opportunity grows from information, where stardust can become a life form. We trip and stumble our way into the discoveries and exploits of evolution over time, something we already have heaps of evidence and good stories around. And how exactly would we evolve a deceptive sense of free will again in an otherwise determined universe? To make us feel better, why would that matter if our feelings don't affect our choices? Why would evolution preserve and complexify all that expensive experience that we know and sometimes love? Why would awareness of choices emerge so dependably if they don't make any difference to our non-existent decisions in the end? See, I just can't buy that. But I did decide to spend a little bit of change on this cake here, and maybe we can cut our cake and eat it too, together. Is this a very merry unwedding to the continuum and real number line as time 
a celebration of games and their surreality. How especially fun when we see, even in just our little fork here, how some structures of interaction need just a wee dram of that water of life, some determining more than distilling by us in the here and now as their choiceful interactors to play them out. A great deal more can and should be said about all the math, physics, computer science, logic, chemistry, biology, neuroscience, music, art, and dare I say it, philosophy, all blooming away richly in this para framework, all this work that frames can do, referencing and arcing around and through all structures we may sense. So stay tuned. <laughs>